from John chapter 1, verses 1, 14, 16, and 17. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. From His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. May God bless the reading from His Holy Word. Please take your seats. So good morning once again. Okay, I'm very sorry for that. Now one of the slogans of the Protestant Reformation, and there were five, remember, is sola gratia. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Why do we call grace amazing, wonderful? Why is so powerful? Well, grace is at the very heart of our Christian faith. We say that it is the bedrock upon which our salvation rests and the fountain from which all blessings of our relationship with God flow. Grace is not merely a theological concept, but the very essence of how God relates to His people. Grace is what sets us apart from just a mechanical religion. Christianity has become so mechanical, legalistic for the last 500 or 1,500 years until the Reformation came. One of the results of the Reformation is that it brings the church back to the grace of God. That everything that happens in the Christian life is about the grace of God. Without a proper understanding of grace, we risk reducing Christianity to a system of rules and self-effort rather than a vibrant, life-giving, spirit-led relationship with God. And so, we have this series beginning this month of October and November. We will be talking about grace. Our theme for the year is rooted. So, we have talked about being rooted in Christ, rooted in the Word, rooted in the church, now we talk about being rooted in grace. Why is grace so important? Now, one of the resources that inspires the series is a book written by David Jeremiah entitled, Captured by Grace. And the subtitle there is that no one is beyond the reach of a loving God. Do you agree with that? No one is beyond the reach of of a loving God. Now, in this book, David Jeremiah is following the song Amazing Grace. And we follow the, the outline. In fact, I follow the, the titles of the chapters of this book as a guide for our sermons every Sunday. And of course, that song was written by John Newton. We know him. We know that John Newton was a former slave trader in the 18th century. You know, Newton was born in London in 1725. He grew up with little religious influence through his mother. At the age of 17, due to the hardships of life, he became deeply involved in the Atlantic slave trade. So that was, you know, at a very young age, he started being part of a slave trade, live a very miserable life. In fact, in his very own words, he says, delight in habitual practice of wickedness was part of my life. He neither feared God nor regarded men. In short, he was a slave to doing wickedness and delighted in sinfulness. However, in the year 1748, during a violent storm, Grace captured John Newton. 
in that storm, he almost died, the, the ship almost drowned. And you have to understand, every time they carried slaves from Africa to England, half of those die along the way. And John Newton saw all, you know, the, the worst things happening. At first, he was callous to all these things. But then, when it was about his own life, he prayed. He survived that storm, and he reached England as a different man. To make the long story short, this slave trader became a pastor. And in the year 1772, he made a sermon for the New Year's Day celebration. And part of that sermon was the song, Amazing Grace. You see, the hymn reflected the life of John Newton, how from a wicked person, how he considered himself a wretched man. He was lost, he was blind, but now he is saved, he can see, he is found. And brethren, since then, Amazing Grace has become an enduring anthem, not just for Christians, even secular singers sing Amazing Grace. And so today, we will start with a series, and we will start with part one of that series with the title, The Capturing Presence of Grace. The Capturing Presence of Grace. And we will focus on the first six words of that song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Why do you think, why do you think John Newton wrote those lines? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know why? Because on that stormy night, God found John Newton. It wasn't John Newton who found God because it is God who is reaching out to us. When we became Christians, it was not us finding God. No, it is God finding us because it is God reaching out to us. And that reaching out of God is what grace is. Amen? Now, long before grace captured the life of John Newton, there was another man who was wretched who was a persecutor of the church, and his name was Saul of Tarsus. And in Acts chapter 9, we find that grace also captured this man, this man who hated Christ, who hated Christianity, who hated the church. One day, the Lord Jesus Christ met him on his way to Tarsus or to Damascus. And there, his life was changed. The same thing that changed John Newton, grace. And why we start with St. Paul? Because our New Testament contains 155 references to the word grace. And 130 of them come from the pen of Paul. So that means in our New Testament concept of grace, we get it, most of it, from the pen of Paul. So, what is grace, by the way? We always talk about grace. In fact, we want our children to be named Grace. Right? It's a nice name. Okay? Grace. What is grace? Well, that is our lesson for today. Okay? Grace, first and foremost, and we know this, is the undeserved presence of God. By the way, present there, I mean gift. See? It's a gift, right? Undeserved present of God. According to Martin Lloyd-Jones, it means unmerited favor. What do you mean by unmerited favor? It means it's a blessing, it's a favor that's given to you. You don't work for it. Unmerited. There is no merit. We understand, you know, during our elementary days, during our Boy Scout and Girl Scout, you know, you do something nice and then you get a, a merit, all right? And you want to accumulate so much merit. Now, grace is unmeritorious, meaning to say you don't do anything to get it. 
it is God who decides to give it to anyone. So it means unmerited favor or kindness shown to one who is utterly undeserving. Notice that. And it is given to us while we are without hope, without God in the world. Meaning to say, brethren, when we were at our worst, God reaches uh, to us. And that is Romans 5.8. You remember Romans 5.8? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Brethren, that is grace. Now, the word grace in the Old Testament, it comes from the Hebrew word hen, and it has so many derivatives. In fact, the word hana or ana means grace. And, of course, the male version of Hana is Johan or John. John means God is gracious, right? That's the word in Hebrew. In the Greek, the Greek word for grace is charis. And, of course, in the English version of that, we have the names charis or charis. Okay, C-H. It can also be spelled with C-H-I-R-I-S, charis or charis. That's where we get the word charisma, gift, okay? It means Lord's favor, freely extended to give away Himself, you know, leaning towards people. That's the idea of grace. God graciously, God freely gives away Himself to people who are undeserving, all right? And we find that from Paul himself. You know, it was Paul who wrote so many things about grace. He started his letter with grace, he ends it with grace, and he talks the doctrine of grace. So, if you want to study grace, you have to go to the letters of Paul because it was St. Paul who really gives us the whole biblical idea of what grace is. Why? Because it was grace that captured him. It was the presence of grace that made this soul into Paul. This person who persecuted the church and now he became a preacher of the gospel because of the grace of God. Now notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 59, For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Notice what Paul says, I don't deserve. See? And that's the concept of grace. Grace comes to us not because we deserve it, not because I'm, I'm doing good, I am kind. No, grace comes to us even when we were bad. It's not like some of us parents, we say to our children, if you clean up your room, I will give you this. That's not grace, that's reward. <laughs> Salvation is grace. Amen? That sets us apart. If, if some of us are Catholics or are here, and perhaps you're asking, what's really the difference, Pastor, between Catholics and Protestants? You know, grace is one of those things that would help us understand. Because in the Protestant theology, in the Protestant faith, we believe that we are saved, we are going to heaven, not for anything that we did or we will do. It is solely by the grace of God. When people reach heaven, it's not because they were more religious, you know, more, more kind and good to others. No. We reach heaven because of the grace of God. And Paul says, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church. That was Paul before grace came. He hated Christ. And his life was determined to destroy the church because he was a Pharisee. You know? And he thought that this Jesus Christ is an enemy to God. But you know what happened? But by the grace of God, notice this, by the grace of God, I am what I am. See that? Paul never, you know, you have to understand St. Paul, when he became a Christian, he was still passionate. He was so passionate to destroy Christ and the church, when he became Christian, he is doubly passionate 
passionate to preach, passionate to plant churches, to make disciples. But you know what St. Paul said? It was not I. It was God. It was the grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. See? It's undeserved, brethren. Even in our salvation, look at Romans 3.23, and we're familiar with this verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us sinners. There's no difference between Jew or Gentile. We all fell short. We all missed the mark. See? None of us deserve to be saved. Even the most religious person cannot save himself. Even his own religion cannot save the person. But notice what the Bible says. All are justified freely. Say freely. freely. That's the word. Freely. Doria. That's the word. Doria, where we get, you know, the word for gift. No? Doron. It's a gift. Freely by His grace. Notice that, brethren. Our salvation, our justification, our being accepted before God. That's the word justified, by the way. That's the meaning of the word justified. Being accepted, being declared righteous before God has nothing to do with our own righteousness. The Bible says it was done freely. See, that's the difference between Catholics and Protestants during the 16th century. For the Catholic faith, they say, well, you can climb up to heaven. You have to go through this ladder. But Martin Luther and the other reformers, through the reading of the Scripture, found that no, there is no such ladder. It is God reaching out to us directly. <laughs> See? There's no ladder to climb. It was grace. It's free. See? You don't declare yourself righteous before God by your own religious system. It is free, and it is His grace, and it is through the redemption that came through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is undeserving. And notice what Paul says in verse 6, Romans 11. And if by grace, notice this, then it cannot be based on work. See that? Because if it's based on work, if, if I do something to deserve it, then you know what the Bible says? Then it is no longer grace. See? When your parents tell you, listen, children, when your parents tell you, you know, your birthday is upcoming, what do you want? And then you say, okay, if you want that gift, clean up your room every day, you're being what? It's, it's not a gift. <laughs> You're just being fooled by your parents. Ma, that's not a gift. <laughs> it's a reward. See? Because grace is something what, that you receive, that we receive, that is not based on work. That's what Paul says. That's what the Bible says. If by grace, then it cannot be based on work. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Even our salvation. For by grace you have been saved. See? It is undeserved. And the Bible is very clear. Not of yourselves. Salvation is not because I'm good. It's not that I go to church more than you. It's not that I tithe more than you. No. The, the Bible is very clear. Grace is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It is the doria of God. The doron of God. That's the Greek word for gift. See, grace is undeserving. According to Dr. David Jeremiah, grace is as infinite and transcendent as the God from whom it flows. He is the God of all grace. So if God is an infinite God, if God is a transcendent God, then therefore the grace available for us is equally unlimited and transcendent. That's why John Newton describes this grace, amazing. When you say amazing, it means it's beyond human comprehension. He could not understand it. You know why? Because he saw his life. He was so wicked. When those African slaves were dying, you know, he wasn't affected by them. In fact, 
He was even guilty of some of the death of these African slaves. And for God to save him, for God to make him a saint, that's beyond human. He okay? doesn't earn it. He doesn't deserve. In fact, he deserves the worst. And yet, heaven was given to John Newton and to Paul. Why? Because it's a gift of God. Amen? Now, another concept when we talk about grace is mercy. And sometimes even some pastors and some theologians would even use the name, the words grace and mercy synonymously, right? Because they're all connected. But I just want us to understand the difference. Because when we see the difference between two words, two descriptions of God, two blessings of God, we would truly appreciate who God is once we understand the Scripture. All right? What's the difference between grace? Some theologians would even say, in the Old Testament, people experience the mercy of God. New Testament, it's grace. Well, I don't think that's the right way to differentiate. Now, mercy. Listen, mercy is God withholding punishment we rightfully deserve. That's the idea of mercy. God is about to, to punish His people, and then God changes His mind. What do you call that? God is merciful. That's the idea of mercy. What is the Bisaya of mercy? Naluoy. See? Paninglan on tatika pro naluoy mango. Sige, ay na lang. Mauna siya. Mercy. God withholding the punishment. But what is grace? Grace is not only God withholding the punishment, but offering the most precious of gifts instead. That's grace. Grace is not just telling you, okay, you are no longer, I'm, I'm no longer punishing you, but instead I will treat you lunch. That's grace. <laughs> See? Grace is not just withholding God's anger, but grace is God expressing His love. That's grace. Okay? Mercy. Let's go through some of the things that happen in the Bible to see where is grace and where is mercy? Mercy withholds the knife from the heart of Isaac. When, 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 when Abraham was about to strike Isaac, mercy was stop that, Abraham. But what was grace? Grace when God provides a ram in the ticket. That was grace. All right? That's the difference there. Mercy runs to forgive the prodigal son. See? Remember the prodigal son? He went out, squandered all the wealth of his father. I mean, do you think that son deserves forgiveness? No. But forgiveness was given to the son. That's mercy. But for the father to throw a party with every extravagance, that's grace. Okay? See, you see there the, the, the play of the grace and mercy with the father. Mercy helps the man beaten by the robbers. Remember, during our... 40 days of habits, benevolence. We talk about the good Samaritan. What was mercy there? When, when the Samaritan stopped and helped that, that man on the road, that was mercy. Naluoy. But what is grace? Grace was the extra mile. Grace covers the cost of his full recovery. That was grace. Mercy hears the cry of the thief on the cross. Grace promised paradise. That very day. Today you'll be with me in paradise. That's grace. Mercy converts Paul on the road to Damascus. God was merciful to him, but grace calls him to be an apostle. See? I mean, it would be okay for God to forgive Paul, but for God to make Paul a preacher of the gospel, to be an apostle, that's already beyond that's grace. Mercy saves, jo saves John Newton from a life of sin. Grace makes him a pastor and author of a timeless hymn. Amazing grace. Mercy withholds the punishment we all deserve. Grace provides salvation we have not earned. Now you understand the difference between grace and mercy, brethren. Mercy is God withholding something we deserve. Grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. See? That's 
mercy and grace. Mercy lifts us out from hell. Grace welcome, welcomes us to heaven. See, that's the difference, brethren. Now, we understand that how amazing grace is. I am going to heaven again, not because I deserve it. Brethren, listen, none of us deserve not even Paul, not even Peter. No one deserves to go to heaven. We all have sinned against God. But praise the Lord for His amazing grace. I'm going there. Are you going there? It's His grace. Amen? The second thing about grace, okay, when we talk about grace, when we study grace, it's always connected to being saved, to our salvation, but then there are other portions of the Scripture that's not just even talking about things in the future because there is also grace for the present. Grace is the unfailing power of God. You know? Grace is the unfailing power of God. Notice again the verse. We studied this in the first part. 1 Corinthians 15.10, No, Paul says, I work hard. Remember, in verse 9, Paul says, I am what I am because of grace. Remember, he says, I am the least of all the apostles. I persecuted the church, but because of grace, I am now an apostle. But Paul went on to say in verse 10, No, I work harder than all of them. Kinsam ng them. All the other apostles. In other words, grace, yes, it changes us, but it doesn't make us lazy. <laughs> grace is undeserving. Grace is a gift, but grace doesn't make a person who tamad. Notice what Paul says. It was grace who made me Paul from Saul. But he says, no, I work harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Friends, Grace saves us from hell. That's true. Grace brings us to heaven. But heaven is still a future place. We still have to deal with sin. We still have to deal with problems. We still have to deal with evil people today. It is still grace that we need. That's what Paul is saying here. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And this is what Paul said in his second letter, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Remember, Paul was saying, I'm just so privileged. You know, I've been to heaven. Remember, Paul was given that opportunity to have a glimpse of heaven. Paul was given the privilege of, of doing miracles. He could even raise a dead man to life. Remember Eutychus? Eutychus, by the way, it reminds me of Eutychus. You know, Eutychus, this was one of the questions as yesterday during the leadership ladder. Who was Eutychus? Eutychus, by the way, you need to know this. Eutychus was that man who was part of the church. Paul was preaching. And by the way, Paul preaches not just one hour, two hours. He preaches the whole day, just like Jesus. And this Eutychus was falling asleep. He was sleeping while Paul was preaching. Mm, yeah. And you know what happened to Eutychus? He fell. Namatay. Alright? But you know what St. Paul did? This is grace. <laughs> okay? That, that man could be an illustration. Ngayon si Paul, see? Tulog-tulog pa mo. <laughs> but you know what Paul did? He went down, healed that man, and that man, Eutychus, was alive again. All right? That's grace. And a lot of us, you know, we want to become like Eutychus. <laughs> we can still fall asleep while, we, while the pastor preached, but here's the difference. I am no Paul. <laughs> if you die sleeping, I may not have the power to bring you back. All right? So, you should not sleep. Why? Because it's important to understand grace. Now, going back to grace. <laughs> all right. You know what Paul said? Even though he has all these privileges, going to heaven, being able to heal a dead man back to life, he was given a thorn in the flesh. 
See, not even St. Paul has the best of both, both worlds. You know, sometimes we think that, you know, as a Christian, when I'm a Christian, because I'm now a Christian, I should not have problems, I should not have miseries. You know, because I'm a Christian, I should be rich, I should be comfortable, I should be convenient, I should live a convenient life. Wrong. Brethren, we are still living in this sin-stricken world. So, you cannot expect everything in life to be comfortable. Not even Paul himself. He was given a thorn in the flesh. And he was asking God. He was begging God, Lord, take this away from me. See? I mean, it's so easy for Paul to say, Lord, look at how many churches I planted. How many are going to heaven because of my preaching? I mean, Paul could do that. Paul could do that. But you know what? Paul says, Lord, heal me. And you know the answer of God. This is the answer of God. No, Paul. <laughs> you will die bringing that thorn in your flesh. But this is the answer of God to Paul. But my grace is sufficient for you. See? He's not talking. Here, God is not just talking about the grace of the gift of salvation going to heaven. But here, God is talking about unfailing power for our daily struggles in life. When we are sick, when we are downtrodden, when we are beset by all sorts of problems and miseries in life, especially aging. Sometimes aging, and praise God, we have so many senior citizens in our church, sometimes aging is not comfortable. How we wish, diba? Right? I'm sure a lot of us would wish, how I wish that I would just die sleeping. If, if there's one thing I'm asking the Lord, that thing, Lord, can I just die sleeping? No, a lot of us, a lot of our brethren died suffering. But this is the answer of God. God's answer to our problems, Lord, remove this sickness, remove this pain, remove this problem. God's answer is no. But God's answer is better than what we want. My grace will sustain you, my child. Amen? Yes, you will still be poor until you die but my grace will sustain you. See? Yes, you cannot have the dream house that you want. <laughs> Dito na lang sa langit, nagsidlak-sidlak ang balay. But my grace will see you through. Amen? That's unfailing grace. For my power is made perfect in weakness. You see what God is saying? When you are weak, that's where my grace shines so bright. And there, this is something that some rich people could not enjoy. See, the difference when you have everything in life, it's so easy for you to neglect God. Why? Because you have everything. See, when you have a problem, you can always withdraw. See, when you, when you lose one car, you, all, you still have three more cars. When your house burns, you still have five more houses. See, I'm not saying that Rich people cannot experience His grace. But what I'm saying is this. People who are going through struggles in life experience and need so much the unfailing grace of God. See? When you're talking about trying to meet ends, meet, that's grace. See? Unfailing grace. But God is saying, it's my power. See? It's not your bank account. <laughs> it's my power that makes you perfect in your weakness. That's why Paul says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. You see that? This is something we need to learn from St. Paul himself who teaches us about grace. Friends, if some of us are suffering, if some of us are miserable, Paul is saying, do not whine. Do not always complain with your Poverty boasts that in that weakness, the power of Christ will rest on you. See? You know, sometimes it's easy for some of us to say, uh, it's okay for you to say that, Pastor, because you haven't went through my life. This is where theology is important, brethren. We don't have to experience that to believe that it's true. 
You just have to believe that this is true because this is the Word of God. Amen? See? That when we go through weaknesses in life, whether it's financial, it's physical, or it's something with our relationships, see? Whatever it is that you are going through right now, let me tell you this. The same grace available for Paul and John Newton is the same grace available for us today. The grace that will see us through. R.C. Sproul says, grace is not a one-time gift, and I like this, but a continuous flow of divine strength. See that? It's not just a one. Sometimes when you say grace, we always think of just heaven. But heaven, pastor, is still so many years from now for some of us. I need the portion of heaven today. And brethren, that portion of heaven today is the grace of God to strengthen us in our weaknesses. When we reach the end of our own resources, that's when God's grace shines the brightest, carrying us through with power that is not our own. That's unfailing grace of God. That's why John Newton could say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You know why he could say that? Because all throughout his past life, it was just bitterness, bitterness. He could always hear the cry of dying African slaves. See? But now, he hears the sweet sound of grace. And then finally, brethren, grace is not only undeserved present of God, gift of God. It's not only the unfailing power of God, but grace is the unmatched person of Christ. The unmatched person of Christ. Someone has written that grace is a five-letter word that is often spelled what? Jesus. To say grace, it means Jesus. You know why? Because Jesus is the fullness of grace. That's our scripture reading. This is now where we come to our scripture reading this morning. Jesus is the fullness of grace. We know this theologically that Jesus Christ and the Father, they are one. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. He is the Word. This Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. But more than the glory, notice what do we see in the glory of Christ. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, and notice this, full of grace and truth. Brethren, we can never define grace outside Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the epitome of what grace is. The life of Jesus, His, his life, His suffering, His death, His resurrection, that's all grace. In fact, Jesus is the only means of grace. Apart from Jesus, there is no grace. Look at verse 16. For from His fullness, the pleroma of God, of Jesus Christ, we have all received what? Grace upon grace. You know, this is so amazing, brethren, because we don't just receive grace, but we receive grace from grace. In the Greek, it literally means what? From one level of grace to the higher. Amen? That's what we receive from our Lord when we trust Him. Grace upon grace. God doesn't give us a platonic grace. No, it's a progressive grace. So that the more you relate with Christ, the more we embrace Jesus into our lives, the more we grow in His grace. John says from, from Him, grace upon grace, we receive. The law was given through Moses, and the law was good because the law teaches us what is right, what is wrong. The law leads us back to God, but it was grace and truth that came through our Lord Jesus Christ. The fullness of grace comes from Christ. Second, grace is given through His sacrifice. You say, how can such grace come to me? How can such grace come to people? Again, notice Romans 3.23 of St. Paul, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace as a gift. 
Notice the next phrase. Through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The grace that saves us. The grace that makes us what righteous before God, acceptable before God, comes only through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In, that, it, that is why, brethren, without the cross, there is no grace. Amen? Without the cross, there is no grace. And then grace reigns through Jesus Christ. Look at Romans 5.20. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, grace can reign in our lives because of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so having known this, brethren, you know, grace, the undeserved presence of God, grace, the unfailing power of God, grace, the unmatched person of Christ, I couldn't help but be muse of John Newton's phrase, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It is my earnest prayer then, brethren, that all of us like Paul or John Newton be recaptured by this grace. So that, yes, we fall, we have problems, we are imperfect, but the grace of God is a capturing, recapturing power so that none of us is beyond the reach of His love. Amen? You come to the Lord because He is a gracious God. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord. This is just the beginning of a two-month journey of studying the Scriptures and what grace is. And even in this first part, Lord, understanding the meaning of grace already amazes us. It's so wonderful that it saves us to the uttermost. But not only is talking about the grace that brings us to heaven, but the grace that would see us through daily. No wonder Paul can say, I am what I am because of the grace of God. And yes, Lord, we are what we are as individuals, as a church, even this church, Bradford Church, where we are today, looking back where we were many years ago, it's all because of your grace. And for that, Lord, you deserve all our praises, all our adoration, because you are a God of grace. And Father, as we prepare ourselves now to receive your grace in the sacrament, we want to remember Jesus Christ, who is grace. Amen.